Thank you for attending today's webinar discussing a novel preclinical model of the normal human breasts. I am Christopher Oak from the World of Bioscience, and I will be your moderator alongside our esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Hannah Harrison from the Manchester Breast Center. Throughout the webinar, please utilize the Q&A tab to ask any questions you may have. We'll gather them and address them towards the end of the session. So let's get started. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Hannah Harrison, a research fellow at the University of Manchester and a leading figure in cancer research with over 20 years of experience. The past eight years, Dr. Harrison has focused her research upon the development of novel models and tools which allow assessment of normal tissue biology, cancer stem cell behavior, tumor heterogeneity, the tissue market environment, and metastasis. Her passion for threes are replacement, reduction, refinement, I led her to commitment to a great deal of effort to develop an alternative to enviable modeling and with funding from the NC3Rs, Cancer Research UK, Breast Cancer Now, Prevent Breast Cancer, and FRAME, she has developed both precancerous and metastatic disease models which replace or reduce our reliance on animals in research. Dr. Harrison, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction. How kind. It's always um it's always humbling to hear uh, an introduction like that. Thank you. And thanks for organizing and thanks to everybody for coming today. Can everyone see the slide? Um, is everyone okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, Dick, I'll make a start then. So yeah, I'm going to talk to you about um, a new model that we've made in the lab um, in which we can study the normal human breast. Um, so just before I start, I wanted to show you this image of, um, of a ductal tree that we found in one of our tissues we thought we'd use this one because it looks just like a real tree but the important thing to note is this kind of structural organization this really fine organization that happens within the normal mammary gland in each duct you can see cells on a, a two layers in a bilayer there's luminal epithelial myoepithelial cells surrounding a lumen and um, which will which will expel the duct the, the milk also this sort of stroma and fibroblasts around it and all of this is really important and all of this is what we've been trying to model so today um, I'm going to just give you some some background, the, the sort of the why is that we're doing this, talk about breast cancer and risk, how we can turn those risks into those risks into prevention opportunities, and talk about some of the models that are currently available. I'll then talk to you um, about our explant model um, and what we're going to do with it, how we've developed it, what we're going to do with it, um, sort of the next steps. And then there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. So please do um, ask anything as we go along. So I'm sure you're all aware breast cancer is the most common cancer in women. In the UK, there's around 56,000 cases diagnosed every year. Uh, screening is getting better. Treatment is getting better. And our 10-year survival rate is about 76% now, which is, which is a big improvement over recent years. But there are still about 11,500 deaths in the UK alone every year. Incidence also continues to rise, so we need to do something to address these people who are still uh, who are still not being saved. It's thought that a proportion of cancers could be prevented and, and Cancer Research UK, this is some data taken from their website, they say that almost a quarter of all breast cancer cases could be prevented. That's their, that's kind of their challenge, that's kind of their um, idea. So this is where we're going to focus today and the majority of what you'll see today has been funded by Prevent Breast Cancer. They're a UK charity who solely support prevention research, so, so they really are um, on board and really um, important in the development of these models. So what are the risk factors of cancer, of breast cancer? Unfortunately, it's very complicated and there's lots and lots of risk factors, but just to kind of try and simplify it, we can break it into a couple of categories, those that are non-modifiable and those that we believe are modifiable. So in non, which I'm sure you hear are things like sex, 99% of breast cancers occur in women. Age, 80% of breast cancers occur in women over 50, um, although actually importantly, the 4% that occur under 40 are typically the worst prognosis tumours, the more aggressive tumours. So age, we can't do anything about age, we all get older can't, and our breast cancer risk increases. Exposure to oestrogen, this is one of the big risk factors in breast cancer. Again, there's very little we can do about the endogenous oestrogen in our systems. The time at which we um, go through menarche, the, the, the length of our um, reproductive years before menopause is, is not controllable. This is out of our hands. 
genetics, family history, ethnicity, very important and unmodifiable. You'll have heard of BRCA1. This mutation in genes causes an, a risk of about 85% for, for people who have that mutation. And also 18% of breast cancers occur in women who have one first family rel relative who has had the disease. So that link with genetics and family are really, really strong, important and, and not modifiable. And finally, um, breast density. So it's a little bit less clear how density, stiffness of the tissue within a breast um, leads to risk being increased. It, it, it does, we can see links, we're not entirely clear on why. Again, that's not something that we can adjust. There's modifiable risk factors, um, physical activity, uh, BMI. We, Breast, um, Cancer Research UK say that they think about 8% of breast cancers in the UK are caused by obesity, by high fat diet. So changing those um, is important. Smoking, alcohol consumption, all increasing the risk, the lifetime risk of breast cancer. And then there's this grey area in the middle with, with things that you could perhaps argue are modifiable, um, but it might seem a little bit, uh, I, I hesitate to say they're modifiable really, pregnancy, age of first, number of pregnancies, um, breastfeeding and, and length of, of breastfeeding time, additional hormones, contraception, HRT, you could argue they're modifiable, but they're also extremely important in the modern world environmental chemicals, bisphenols, parabens, all linked with increased risk, not modifiable on a personal level, but perhaps on a more governmental level and an environmental level, it is, it is modifiable. So lots of risks, lots of kind of scary things really, but as I said earlier, these give an opportunity for us to intervene, we believe. The modifiable factors, relatively simple interventions are required, not easy interventions, asking somebody to change their lifestyle, but simple to put in place. Exercise, um, eating a lower fat diet, abstaining from too much alcohol, uh, at stopping smoking, for example. Slightly more extreme, but extremely effective for women with very high risk um, of the disease, surgical intervention, is an option. People can have a double mastectomy, for example, and this reduces their risk by about 95%. It's extremely effective. Excuse me. The, the problem is, however, it's also a massive undertaking. It's a massive life change. It's a big decision. It's not suitable for every person who we, who we tell has, a, has an increased risk. So another option is to step in in a medical way, to use preventative agents. Um, and this is what I'm going to focus on. This is what I'll talk to you about today. What do we mean by preventative medicine? So there are three um, it, preventatives currently licensed in the UK um, to use in the preventative setting. Tamoxifen, you may have heard of, raloxifene, maybe not. These are both inhibitors that stop estrogen signaling by blocking um, estrogens binding to its receptor. Anastrozole is another. This is um, an aromatase inhibitor. It basically stops estrogen being produced in the body, so there's less estrogen available. And we know that if women take these medicines, there's a risk reduction of around 40%. What does that mean? If we have 100 ladies here at the bottom, all of whom have a 10% lifetime risk, 10% of them will develop breast cancer in their life. If all 100 of them take tamoxifen, for example, and stick to the, to the regime, then uh, four of those women will not develop breast cancer. That would have. So we've reduced the risk in that population from 10 out of 100 to 6 out of 100. Now, that seems great, doesn't it? If, you, if, if you're looking at those numbers, you think that's great. We'll take tamoxifen. That's fine. The problem is that tamoxifen and the other uh, preventatives are pretty horrible drugs. They're not well tolerated at all. Women report side effects from mood disorders to hot flushes and night sweats, vaginal dryness, weight gain, and that list goes on and on. We could talk for 15, 20 minutes about the side effects of tamoxifen. If a lady is given tamoxifen as part of their breast cancer treatment, they generally take the medicine and they put up with the side effects. It's curing a cancer, it's treating their cancer. But in the prevention setting, they could easily be one of the 90 people who won't get breast cancer. So to ask them to take a drug with so many side effects is difficult. 
uptake is poor. And even for those who do take it, adherence is low because those side effects become just intolerable and not worth it. So clearly, knowing that we can affect risk with drugs, we need to identify new drugs, better drugs, drugs with less side effects, drugs with the same or better risk reduction. If we could reduce it to, you know, two out of 100 women and the side effects were a bit more tolerable, maybe more people would jump on board and maybe they would stick to the, to the plan. To develop these treatments, though, extensive testing is required obviously we need to go through many many rounds of testing and unfortunately currently about 95 percent of drugs fail somewhere between development in a lab and being getting going into patients somewhere in that in that timeline they fail and i think we think people think that a lot of that is down to poor preclinical models we're testing drugs in the lab in a way that is not representative of what's happening in people, in women. So we need to find a way to move that gap a bit closer, find better models. So there's a number of models out there being used and they're very good in their own way. Um, we use um, all of them in our lab. There's patient-derived organoids. This um, image is taken by one of our brilliant PhD students, Casey. She's been culturing primary cells as organoids. So this is great. We've got away from cell lines that people kind of hate. Um, we're using primary cells. Casey can take these organoids, break them into single cells and replate them and passage them over time. So she can continually use the same patient sample over multiple experiments, which is a really powerful tool. The problem, however, is that the tissue has been enzymatically digested into single cells. So we've got rid of all of the um, stroma, all of the fibroblasts, everything that came out of the, of the patient with the tissue. They also get grown in Matrigel. Matrigel is a great product. Everybody uses it and will continue to use it for many years, I'm sure. But it's mouse derived. It's rodent derived. So the, the extracellular matrix and all of its components are mouse. So those two things in mind, we've basically put these organoids into a place with none of the normal human extracellular matrix, none of the normal cell-cell interactions, which are important. So there's a number of, of downsides to that model. Another is slice culture. We've used this, we've published on this. It's a great culture system. We can take tissue. It's really simple. You slice it, you stick the tissue on a surgical foam support, douse it in media, and it can grow for a good period of time. It maintains the tissue structure, that bilayer I showed you at the start. The problem is, though, that that tissue becomes unresponsive to hormones like oestrogen, which, as I've said, is one of the most important risk factors in breast cancer development. So we, we can't culture tissue that doesn't respond to oestrogen and hope that it's a good model um, for our patient. Again, there's no matrix it's lost, and it's lost that support. It doesn't have any of the structure that it had within the breast. A big problem with all in vitro models, not just those two, but mo you know any other in vitro model you find for normal breasts, is that within the first week or so, there's a massive increase in proliferation. Maybe it's because we take the tissue out of the body and some kind of natural inhibition is lost. Maybe it's that the culture media we give to the tissue is so good that they just grow like wildfire. They're, they're so happy to be growing. But as P67 proliferation is a really important thing within tissue that we need to maintain. We need to keep the tissue normal and happy and stable. This is just showing some data from Suad, uh, one of our um, old PhD students, a, a, a postdoc now. Um, she tried out a number of different culture systems. One was culturing chunks in suspension in a sort of a rotatory system. One was placing chunks on plastic and one was putting them in an insert like a Boyden chamber and having them suspended in media. And you can see the red bar here on all of the repeats you did in all of the different conditions. At day seven, there was a massive spike in proliferation. So just taking them from the patient, culturing them caused this massive change. And you can see the key 67 cells here in the panels on the right. The brown cells are positive. They're the proliferating cells. So in vitro is not great. There's a number of issues with in vitro. In vivo, it's really complicated. 
it's complicated in any case, but with normal breast, very little is done um, in vivo. Mostly in vivo, xenografting models are, are cancer based, but people do do it and it does work. And we see lovely human epithelial ducts can persist, that structure you saw at the beginning. But very quickly following implantation and as they grow, the stromal cells and the XLA matrix of the mouse take over. These cells have also got no immune system and we know that immune cells are vital in, in development of cancer, but also in response and in uh, to, to treatments and to therapies. So really important to get the human stroma, extracellular matrix and the human immune cells back in play. So clearly after a whistle stop tour of, uh, of modeling, um, our conclusion was that we needed a better model. And we wanted our model to maintain the most important characteristics of the normal breast. Stable proliferation, as I mentioned, we need key 67 to stay level. This is an endpoint of many um, experiments. We add a hormone, we add a drug, and we ask what happens to proliferation. So if proliferation changes just by culture, we can't use that model. Viability, the tissue needs to remain viable. Another quite important endpoint of therapy is, is cell apoptosis, is tissue necrosis, is death. So we need the tissue to stay viable. We'd like to maintain the structure that you saw at the beginning, those bilayer, that important um, bilayer shows healthy, normal tissue. That starts to change as, as disease begins in, in early stage disease. We need to look at the hierarchy of the cells within the tissue. We know there are stem cells in the breast, very important cells in normal breast. Um, every time we cycle through pregnancy, lactation and involution, they're important. But they also play a major role, we believe, in the initiation of cancer. I've mentioned already the immune cells, the stromal cells, really important if we're going to look at drug responses in our model. Stiffness, mentioned at the beginning, density and stiffness, very important. So it's important that we can, we can adjust this and look at this impact in our model. And finally, responsiveness to hormones. We need our breast tissue to continue responding as it would within the patient. So all of those characteristics important, but also when you work in, especially in academic research, there's a couple of other really important things for a model. It needs to be simple. It needs to be reproducible and it needs to be inexpensive. Realistically, if this model we develop is going to be taken up around the world, around the country, uh, it needs to be simple, reproducible and relatively inexpensive. So with all of that in mind, we began to develop our model. And this is the model. I'm going to talk you through this in detail and tell you how we came to the model. But in brief, the model is taking risk reduction mammoplasties from ladies who, who come into the Christie or, or, or Withenshaw hospitals in Manchester. We chop the, the, the breast tissue into small chunks, embed them in hydrogel, culture them over time with drugs or with hormones, and then we take them out, fix them, um, paraffin embed them, and then we can perform in, immunohistochemistry on them to see if we can see any changes within the cells. So the first thing we wanted to look at was medium. As I said, we think select the wrong medium and your cells proliferate like wildfire. So we wanted to choose a good medium. And we looked at three. We looked at a published medium from the Hans Clavers lab. It was designed for organoids. We use it in our organoids. You can just see from that list, when I was writing this list, it made me think back to that slide of requirements. This is far from simple. And it's also far from inexpensive. This is a, com this is a complicated, expensive medium. We use it in, in the right situation, so we tried it in this. We use another one, which is DMMF12 containing B27. And a little spoiler alert in that title, it's also called explant medium, so you can tell which one we're going to pick and move forward with. But it's just DMMF12 with B27, a little bit of glutamine and some antibiotics. And then the third is another one that we use in explant culture in the lab, which is just DMMF12 with fetal calf serum and antibiotics. So we compared those three media to see which one, uh, which one was best. So here you've seen these already now, but these are key 67 stained tissues, day zero, seven and uh, sorry, three and seven, either in clavers media, explant medium or fetal calf serum containing medium. And we're looking at key 67, which are these brown cells that you can see. 
when we quantify this, um, we can see that by day seven, which is when SUAD saw that big increase in proliferation in both cleavers medium and the fetal calf serum, we see a significant upregulation of proliferation. Not as high as SUADS, but still a significant and consistent rise in proliferation. Um, whereas in the explant medium, you can see there's no change in proliferation at all from the from the blue circles, the day zero tissue. So we had selected our medium, the, the B27 containing explant medium. The next thing was to think about hydrogel. Um, really taking into account what I said earlier about wanting to be able to control the stiffness and the environment that our tissue was was in and we chose um to do to make this model in vitro gel um rgd from from the well for a number of reasons initially the first reasons that we chose it for was that it was really easy to use this um hydro does liquid at room temperature you don't need to use chilled pipettes and and work on ice like you do with matri gel it's really simple in that it sets with the addition of medium. There's no cross-linking required. And it's really easy to handle than most of the other things we tried. So those were really why we first picked it. It still ticks the box of relative inexpensiveness. It's comparable to others on the market. It's not free, it's not cheap, but it's comparable. And another reason that we really liked it was the ease at which you can tune the stiffness of it. So in the experiments when we first started, we selected low, moderate and high stiffness. And this table's just showing you how, how you do that. For the high, it's just straight uh, vitro gel mixed with extracellular, um, sorry, explant medium to start solidification, start um, gelling. Moderate's a 50-50 mix of gel with PBS. Um, and low is 100 microliters of gel with 200 of PBS. So we had these three stiffnesses that we were going to test alongside no gel at all, so no stiffness at all, and we would see which was best. So again, same thing, key 67 stains, um, day zero, three and seven in no gel, low stiffness, moderate and high. And if we bring up the chart, you can see that in the no gel, and the low gel by day seven, this really big spike in proliferation. In the high gel, this happens early on, happens at day three. But when we look at the moderate, the 50-50, the there's no change in proliferation. So we were happy with that and we were to move forward with that. So the model is now a little bit more um, filled in. We, we're growing them in that explant medium that I described to you and the the, the explants are encased in vitro gel RGD at our moderate stiffness, that 50 50 um, dilution. So, the next step when we selected all of this was to move on to, to validate it in a big panel. And we have we had 15 patient samples um, that had been we had to put through the systems we did, and we looked at to, um, to see how they were maintained. So here's showing you um, an H&E stain of just one of them as an example. It shows a really nice bilayer like we showed you at the beginning, that um, luminal and myoepithelial layers around the duct. Um, and that persists throughout the culture. When we get to day seven, we start to see these little vacuoles forming. And this vacuolation um, is a sign of progesterone um, response. It's seen in the luteal phase of um, of the menstrual cycle. So it could suggest the tissues responding to progesterone. We need to do some more work on that to make sure that is what it's doing. But we were really happy that the structure was maintained. Proliferation, the thing I said was probably the most important, is unchanged. Across 15 patient samples, across seven days, we see no change in proliferation in our defined medium and hydrogel um, environment. Viability. So viability we assessed with cleaved caspase 3. Um, this we couldn't really statistically analyse because in our model there was very little cell death. You can see one cell there that's a bit brown with a red arrow pointing at it, but really we saw nothing. Over here I've just shown an example coming from the um, FCS medium when apoptosis was much higher. So we did see it. It wasn't a, a staining issue. It was that the tissue was just really happy and viable. What about the hormone receptors? Um, so, first of all, ER. Once again, the staining is uh, chromogenic. The ER positive cells are brown. You can see them uh, day 0, 3 and 7. And over the full seven days, we don't lose estrogen receptor expression. 
in fact we see a slight increase we're not entirely sure what that means so we'll, we will keep looking into that the same pattern is actually seen in progesterone receptor so progesterone receptor is downstream of estrogen signaling so it is often very closely linked um, in its expression and it does the same thing it, it persists throughout seven days and potentially increases um, by day seven so we'll look into that more but we're happy the hormone receptors are there are they responsive to hormones or are they just sitting there I showed you earlier the vacuolation does suggest that progesterone is being responded to. It needs further investigation. But we also added estrogen or 17 beta estradiol into our culture systems with or without fulvestrum, which is an inhibitor similar to tamoxifen. And you can see that when we add um, 17 beta estradiol, those pluses on the top line, we get an increase in proliferation as we would expect. And then when we add in fulvestrant, the inhibitor, we lose that proliferation. So the tissue is responding to estrogen and it is going through ER alpha because that's a direct target of fulvestrant. And as I said, progesterone receptor is downstream of estrogen and we see the same pattern. As we add estrogen, progesterone receptor expression increases, fulvestrant blocks it. So we're really happy the tissues remained responsive to hormones. It's working well with hormones. Immune cells, very early data, very, uh, you know, we just looked at a few. We looked at CD4, CD8, CD68, so T helper killer T and macrophages within our tissue. Um, and you can see them within the introductal and intraductal, so in between the ducts, that they're, they're throughout the tissue and they do persist throughout culture. We do start to see them falling off towards the end of the culture. So we are working to see if we can find ways to just uh, tweak it a little bit to try and keep those cells present for a bit longer. Maybe there's an, uh, something we can add in that will help. So there's the model. Did we make the model that we set out to do? It's very simple. Anyone can do it. It's relatively inexpensive compared to anything else on the market. And it's extremely reproducible across all of the patient samples. We saw the same response to, to, um, to culture, to estrogen and to fulvestrin. Um, so the characteristics, stable proliferation showed you the availability no change the structure the bilayer is maintained the stroma looks similar uh, and there are some changes that we need to investigate perhaps downstream of progesterone i showed you that the stiffness was tunable and actually that the stiffness was vital so we need to look at if slightly smaller changes in stiffness can be used within the model to to um to demonstrate changes in stiffness within the breast Hormone responsive, I showed you that, that it's still responsive to hormone. Cellular hierarchy, the immune cells and the stromal cells within the system still need to be tested. And this is what's being done at the moment. This kind of fine tuning and final validation of the model is underway. And that's being done by a PhD student in our lab. Another project funded by Prevent Breast Cancer um, is being done by Anthony, and he's characterizing those epithelial cell compartments, assessing the cellular hierarchy, looking at stem cells, looking at the different cells within the bilayer, characterizing further the stroma and the immune cells, seeing if we can keep them within the culture for longer, and also trying to increase the culture to 14 days to see if we could have a bit of a bigger window to, to play around with, with these tissues. As well as doing that, Anthony's moved on to the next step and he's trying to see if we can, we can use the model to assess the effect of inhibitors or preventatives. Um, and I'm just going to show you one example of what he is and will be doing, just so you can see how the model fits into our pipeline. And that's looking at tamoxifen. So there's a trial that's ongoing in Manchester called the Breast Biomarker of Chemo Prevention, BBCP. It's a trial of tamoxifen, um, and, and we have access to, to this data in these samples through our collaborator, our clinical collaborator, Sasha Howell. In the study, patients have a vacuum-assisted biopsy from one breast, and then they go on three months of tamoxifen, and then they have a vacuum-assisted biopsy of the other breast, tissues embedded or, or used for RNA. Um, seek and we look at changes um, from, from pre to post uh, treatment of tamoxifen. So this work again is done by Suad who I mentioned earlier but also uh, another fellow in the lab Bruno uh, and they looked at tamoxifen in those 
pre those baseline and post treatment biopsies and the general trend across all patients was that tamoxifen reduced proliferation that's what we would expect it should be blocking estrogen signaling proliferation should fall great so I moved the um, idea into the explant model and was a little bit concerned, I have to say, because we found that in those first three days with tamoxifen, some of the patient samples lost proliferation, the proliferation decreased, as we'd expect, but some showed an increase in proliferation, which was a bit concerning. But we went back, Seward and Bruno went back and looked at those patients in more detail in their in their work. And you can see from this chart here, this is the full change in um, key 67 relative to baseline. And some women, some patients have an increase in, in proliferation in key 67. So showing exactly what we've shown within our model. We were interested to know how and why that was happening. Why were some people responding to tamoxifen in the wrong, in inverted commas, way? And they took some of those samples that did RNA-seq um, and they found, if you see here on these, um, this plot, uh, red means upregulated gene, blue means down. And you can see there's this pocket of genes that are upregulated and they line up almost perfectly with those ladies who have increased proliferation. And those genes, when we look into it, are all known to be linked to tamoxifen resistance in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. So there's something really interesting in there and there's something important in there. We need to find out how and why and which patients will respond in which way to tamoxifen. So Anthony's going to take a, a, a further step, add a further step to that BBCP trial, take an extra biopsy at the beginning culture it in our explant model and treat it with tamoxifen. We'll then compare baseline to post in patient and post in explant. And we'll look to see if we can see that similarities in our model to the patient. Can we show the same response in our explants as we see in the patients? That's really important and really powerful if we can do that. Can we model the effect of different levels of tamoxifen is another question. A lot of ladies who don't tolerate tamoxifen well are using smaller and smaller doses. Are they still seeing an effect? And is that the same uh, in all patients and can we model it? What does gene expression tell us about the non-responders? Can we identify patients who will, will and won't benefit from tamoxifen treatment uh, before they go on to it? That would be an amazingly, that would be a great thing to be able to do. So to summarise and tell you what I've told you, I hope that I've shown you we've got this great tunable hydrogel defined medium culture system set up that allows us to grow and maintain tissue for seven days um, in vitro. Showing you that there's no changes in proliferation or viability and that the structures of the breast, the ducts within the breast remain unchanged. Um, and immune cells persist. We need to do more with the immune cells, but they are there and that's really encouraging. We're now using the model along with further optimization and comparing it to a clinical trial of tamoxifen. And the real aim of that is to prove that we can, you know, we can validate this model to test new preventative therapies, hopefully driving more of them forward to the clinic, to successful translation to the clinic. So before I finish, um, acknowledgements are always the most important slide. Sasha Howells, our clinical um, collaborator, he's been uh, played a major role in this from the beginning, along with Gillian Farney, um, who was at the University of Manchester, but now is at the Francis Crick. Um, Ling did all, lots of RNA sequencing data, which I haven't shown you today. I didn't have time to show you today, but she did lots and lots of work, um, which will be uh, used in the future. Anthony, who I mentioned, is our new student. The whole of breast biology, the team I sit within, Casey, Suad, Sarah, Bruno, all of their um, works contributed to this uh, and to the paper that is um, in submission. Um, and as well as all of the, as well as all of the uh, funders prevent breast cancer specifically, really important to thank all of the patients who've donated their tissue to us, um, collected through the MCRC Biobank. Without them and without their willingness, we wouldn't be able to do any of this work. So I'll stop and take any questions that anybody has. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Harrison, for that excellent presentation. And we hope your work uh, in this field, really, it reaches out to a lot of the researchers and, and hopefully touch the patients uh, down down the line. Um, thank you all for attending. I'd like to go to questions and answers now. If you.
please, uh, you can type it in your uh, Q&A uh, chat button and we'll uh, go from there to the chat, uh, questions and answer. I do have one here. Do you think the same concept of this new model can be used for other tissue types for diagnostic purposes? Yeah, why not? I mean, we've got no evidence to prove that, but yes, why not? I think, you know, the, the normal breast is an extremely complicated tissue and, you know, all the others will have their own complications. But I think if you, I don't know what tissue you might be thinking of, but uh, perhaps lung, maybe you could embed lung and have a look to see. You might need to change the stiffnesses and the medias, but yeah, why not? It's, uh, and as I say, I think the beauty of it is the simplicity of it because it's so simple and so tunable and so adjustable. I think it can be optimized quite easily for for anything, for any tissue, normal or cancerous state. Thank you. Okay. For your current model, can this model be used for immunodiagnostic? Wow, not in not in my hands, no. <laughs> I don't have any experience of that or expertise in that. I don't know is the answer, potentially. I'm sure in the right hands with the right um set of brains behind it, I'm sure that it could. Okay, no problem. And uh, how far do you think this model can be used for clinical applications? How far do I think? I think that I think if we can validate that last bit that we were just I was just talking about the tamoxifen, if we can show the same response in our um, in our expert model as we see in those patients, the same patients, the same tissue, the same response, I think it will really open it up to to be used a long way through the clinical pipeline. I think you know. Really, I don't know if it will ever replace animals uh, 100%. I think there'll always be a requirement for in vivo work, but I think it could take it all the way there and show that a new preventative has the same or better effect on proliferation than tamoxifen, or it has the same or better effect in a larger proportion of women. What will be great if we can, if we can use this model to identify a gene signature, say that we could, when a patient comes in, we could take some blood, we could run a panel and we could say, you will respond to tamoxifen in the, in the way that you want or you won't. That means that we can, own, we can give this quite horrible drug, this quite nasty side effects drugs to people who will benefit from it. That will not only reduce suffering, but it will also make that percentage um, uh, risk reduction even better because it's it, it's only showing its work in patients who will respond well. Thank you. That's a great answer. Um, I have uh, one uh, question is, thank you for your great talk. Have you used this model to look at the individual phenotypes of cell populations, example, macrophage phenotype? No, and that is something that we will be doing. Um, yeah, so that's part of Anthony's PhD. Unfortunately for Anthony, every time we talk to people about this, they have another fabulous question and another really important question to answer. And that's one of them that we need to do. And hopefully we will do within this PhD or we'll have to expand and get some more money in and do it. Yeah, really important. We haven't done it yet. OK, OK. Another question from uh, Edward Park in here. Have you found a limitation on the size of the tissue that can be embedded before losing the linkage between the how native tissue reacts? That's a really, really great question. And it's it's one that I can't answer exactly. No is the answer. We haven't tried multiple sizes to any um decent level we you know in the early days we were chopping it up quite randomly but no we haven't looked at two compared to four compared to six millimeters say um anthony is currently trying to culture multiple cores in each well so two or three small cores in each well we think there's enough room there's enough room for them to be encapsulated on their own within gel but whether that's too much for the gel we don't know maybe we'll have to transplant the explants maybe we could put them into fresh gel we need to follow all that the answer is no not yet we don't know okay thank you another question is that they i see the transfer has been used in this model is it a requirement or can we use more high throughput example 96 or 384 well plates i mean i absolutely think you can i think it's just about getting the um the stiffness or the elastic modulus of the of the gel right so yeah i think it would take a little bit of fine tuning the reason we've used it in 
in um, hanging cultures is is really a throwback to to previous explants the cultures that we've done that's how we've done it we've put them in um in in wells it also means that the media is getting to them from all different sides you know if, if it's in a 96 well plate it'll be the media will be on top but not bottom and not sides so i think you know the hanging well does add something um but i'm sure with some optimization you could you could very quickly answer that question if you wanted to do it in a more th high throughput way thank you thank you uh, again, thank you for your wonderful presentation. A question is the viability of the tissue in the hydrogel dependent on the donor's age. Do you notice a did you notice a correlation? That's another brilliant question um, and something that we haven't looked at particularly simply because we really didn't see much viability issue in our once we defined our method, very little um, death was occurring. We do have all of that data on the we, or we have that available. We could find out the age of the patients through the through the biobank. Um, but no, I don't think I don't think we've even looked at that because the viability has been so good. Okay. Great question, though. Thank you. Um, I want to wait for more questions. Does anyone else has any other questions? We'll wait for a few more minutes. And, oh, I have a question. Can we use spheroid cells in that? Can you put spheroids in hydrogel? Um, yeah, uh, sure, definitely you can. Yeah, in fact, we are planning on doing that. We haven't um, grown patient spheroids in it yet. That's not really what useful for this model for our attempt at a preclinical model because we lose all of the uh, tissue structure in an organoid but yeah you certainly could a lot of people are moving away from those sort of more animal based um gels and i think that's only you know that can only be a good thing the, the less reliance on animal um products the better for me so yeah for sure okay thank you i guess this um one question is is there any other gels used other gels, as in from different companies. Yeah, we did try a few. I don't really want to. Uh, <laughs> I don't really want to badmouth any. You know, we we tried a few that are commercially available gels out there, um, and this one was just easier to use and far more reproducible than the others. Thank you. That is that was not from our from our side. <laughs> that was from a question. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. Um, she, I guess that the the the, the, the uh, to reiterate that question, which means to ask you know, if any other hydrogels use, if so, what changes they saw in cell growth? I, I, I presume it's probably, is it our hydrogels? Because we have many versions, so. I see, so uh, maybe I, with your, yeah. No, we didn't use any of the different uh, vitro gels. We went for RGD because the literature sort of led us to believe that was the right thing to choose. And we got lucky, really. It was the one It was the one we tried and it was the one that worked. Whether it would work in others, I'm sure that it would. Um, and it needs investigating. We haven't done that. Great. Thank you. OK, any other questions? Don't think we'll have any more, but you know, again, uh, Dr. Hannah, thank you for much that a great as presentation. And um, for any other set, uh, questions you may have, please reach out to uh, our contact information uh, or reach out to Dr. Hannah herself as well. I want to thank everyone for attending, and uh, please follow us on LinkedIn for future webinars, and also visit our website, Project or Products, 3D Cell Culture Applications, or anything that we can do to help on your 3D uh, research. Please reach out to us. Uh, as you can see, um, we look learn look forward to having anyone uh, else uh, using our system and having a presentation uh, with us as well. Thank you, Dr. Hannah. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks.